morning. Uh, I want to begin with a public service announcement, and that is if you are riding our golf carts, either in or out, that the seat that you're sitting on can be used as a flotation device. So just keep that in mind in case the waters keep coming up, you'll be all right. Uh, hey, a lot going on this week as you heard the announcements and a couple of things that I want to kind of just uh, push a little bit further your direction as you heard uh, about Eden Clinic and the baby bottle boomerang. This is where we give the baby bottles out on Mother's Day, pick them up on Father's Day and in between you fill them up with all kinds of money and change. And it's a great blessing to the Eden Clinic. I have the privilege of being on the board of Eden Clinic. And uh, one of the things that we're going through right now is that we have been asked to leave the building that we're in in Norman. We have, they've taken the lease away from us and uh, we are needing a new place. And so that's going to be a huge expense for the ministry. Our Midwest City uh, branch, Eden Clinic, is doing good, going strong. Uh, but we've been asked to move out of the building that we're in now. And so the good news is, first of all, God is faithful. And also, there are two amazing churches in Norman that came together and said, hey, we're going to stand with you, arm uh, arm in arm, link arms with you, and we're going to begin a capital campaign, and our churches are going to be involved in helping you guys raise money and get a building. So thank God for that, and uh, we're excited about that. But anything that you give towards this ministry, saving babies, helping moms, uh, make choices and have choices and dads as well. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, and then our base camp meets Tuesday night. Let me say something to all the men that are here this morning. Let me say this. You matter. You matter to God. You matter to this church. You matter to me. And I believe that God wants to raise up kingdom men. Now, let me describe what a kingdom man is. To become a kingdom man doesn't mean that you have to give up any of your manhood. I think sometimes we have the idea that becoming a Christian man or a kingdom man means that I've got to fit into a particular mold. Dr. Tony Evans uh, wrote a book called Kingdom Man, and he, he gives an example. And he says, men, you know, and just for the wives is that, you know, we can hold our wives' purse. We can do that. We're capable of doing that. We just don't like doing that. And, uh, but we can and sometimes I think when we think of Christian men, we think, well, that's, you know, we're just going to sissify men and, and bring them down. And yet that's totally opposite of what a kingdom man is. David, King David was a kingdom man. David was a warrior and a worshiper. David was a family man and he was an incredible king that led a nation. And so we're going to have a great meeting Tuesday night for the men and I look forward to seeing all of our men down there being apart. 6.30, we're going to feed you and have a great evening together. Uh, this morning, I want to take the few moments that we have, and I want to talk to you. We're kind of in between series right now. Just finished a series, uh, uh, 10 Qualities of a Believer, the move you from a believer to become a disciple. Next week is Father's Day, then stake your claim. So I just have an opportunity to take a few Sundays before we jump into another series and just talk to you just from my heart what I feel is something that we need right now, a right now word. And what I want to talk about this morning is keeping God first in our lives. And I think that is so significant and so important that we do that. In fact, I can't think of any greater advice that I could give to anyone this morning other than to say straight across the board, here it is, keep God first. Keep God first place in your life. And I've often said that if there is an area of your life that isn't working, make sure that God is first in that area. If you're here this morning and you say, well, my prayers aren't getting answered, put God first. My marriage isn't working out the way that I want it to, put God first and do marriage God's way. My finances just are in a mess. Put God first and do finance God's way. Whatever it is in your life that's not working, if we make a point to put God first, God has a way of, of turning it around. So how many of you would agree this morning that, that no one just simply hands you a great life, right? Nobody just says, hey, here's life, have a great life. 
but that if you want a great life, you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to put some effort into it. And it's not always just the outward battles that we're fighting against. There are those things. Sometimes we battle people. Sometimes we batter, battle prejudices or, or sometimes there's discrimination or physical limitations. And we have to fight those things to overcome in life. But I think sometimes the things that, that really wear us down are the inner battles that we have to fight. Those inside things. It may be emotions, feelings thoughts, inner struggles, or whatever. And I'm pretty confident this morning that everyone here is battling something, dealing with something in their life. And as I was putting these notes down on paper and just, you know, having that time with God of connecting and, and, and asking him about this service, I just felt this one word keep coming up in my spirit that I felt like I just wanted to kind of pray that out and pray over the church. And that's the word strategy is that I think God wants to give us a strategy so that we can overcome in life. But the problem is, we're not in a place that we can hear God. See, if God has a plan for what you're going through and wants to give you a strategy for what you're going through, you've got to come to a place that you can hear what God is saying. And if you want to know what God's strategy is, you've got to be still and know what God is speaking to your heart. You got to come to a place where you can shut down the white noise, all the background noise, and you can begin to hear God. And I think sometimes we forgot that God wants us to wait on him. Those that wait on the Lord, the Bible says, those are the ones that are renewed. Those are the ones that are raised up. Those are the ones that God gives a strategy to so that we can overcome in life. And it's just part of keeping God first place and not letting all these other things that are battling for first place push God out and push God to the side. So how many of you would agree this morning that your life is worth fighting for, right? I mean, your marriage is worth fighting for. Your kids are worth fighting for. Your ministry, your vision, your, your goal, what it is God has called you to do is worth fighting for. Your walk with God is worth, worth fighting for. We just want to make sure we're fighting in, in the right direction. I think all of us here have heard the phrase, fight fire with fire, right? And basically what that means is, you know, if, if there's a fire, oftentimes firefighters and, and force, uh, force rangers, if there's a big fire that's coming, they will start a backfire to meet that fire and fight, fighting fire with fire. Have you realized this morning that this is Pentecost Sunday? This is the beginning of the church age. This is the, the day that we celebrate that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the face of the earth and, and the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, the dispensation of the church is happening right now. We are right in the middle of what I think is one of the most exciting dispensations that is mentioned in the Bible and we're a part of it. And it is that fire dispensation. And it's my heart and it's my prayer that God would spark something on the inside of us. So in other words, so that we're not just going through life on autopilot. We're not just going through life, going through the motions. But we're going through life because there is a passion to do what we do. And I just pray that God would start a fire in our life so that something on the inside. In fact, think a moment. If, if you had to compare your spiritual life to a fire, how would you describe that? If you had to describe where you are with God, what's on the inside of you, what that walk of God looks like right now, and you're comparing it to a fire, what would that look like? And there's basically three categories. One, there's non-existent. You know, sometimes before you can build a fire, you got to put some things together. And so if, there, if you're not purposely working on building a fire, there's not going to be a fire. And that may be the spiritual condition of pe some people that are here this morning. The other stage of a fire is, is what I call something that is, uh, that is uh, smoldering. 
that you look at it and you realize, well, at one time there was a fire. There's evidence that something was burning. There's evidence that something was there. It's not there now, but maybe if I stir, maybe if I spend some time working on it, I can find an ember, I can find a coal, something I can stir up that fire. And then the third category would be blazing. Man, I am on fire. My heart is burning with the things of God. And so on, on using that as a scale, looking at yourself, what would your report card be? What's it going to look like? Is, is, it, is it non-existent? Is it smoldering? Or is there literally something there that God is doing on the inside of you? Because here's the thing about a fire that we all realize is that fires don't just happen. They don't just build themselves. If you're going to have a fire and you're going to build a fire, it takes some preparation. It takes some strategy. And you got to be willing to gather some material. You got to be willing to stack it together. You got to think it through and think here's, here's what's going to happen. Fires have to be made. Thought has to be given to it. And then once the fire is started, here's the key. It's got to be maintained. Because if you don't feed the fire and you don't keep throwing fuel on the fire... It's going to burn out. So even once, even once God stirs something up on the inside of you, it's our responsibility to feed the fire. Say that with me. Feed the fire, right? We got to feed that fire. Well, how do I do that? Listen, you being here today is feeding the fire. You sitting in church, you sitting, hearing the voice of God, hearing what God is saying, letting God deal with you, that is feeding the fire, when we were worshiping a moment ago, that is fuel that God is throwing on, that you have that heart for God and, and you're worshiping him feeds the fire. Maybe it's prayer, maybe it's outreach, whatever it is, that we're constantly doing something that is just keeping what is on the inside of us stirred up. One of my favorite Old Testament characters is Samson. And I guess probably every kid likes Samson. We love the story of Samson. We love hearing about uh, the great things that he did, the, uh, the exploits that he had. But the part of Samson, the story that I like, is not the first part of his life. It's the last part of his life. And if you remember the last part of his life, the fire had gone out. So now we don't see Samson fighting the Philistines. We don't see Samson breaking the strings and, and the ropes and all the fetters and the chains and everything they put on him. Now we see Samson that he's broken, that he's empty. He's in prison. The Philistines gouged his eyes out so he's blind. And they've hooked him up to this big uh, grinder that he just simply, his life consists of just getting up every morning and walking in circles, grinding meal, grinding corn. That's his life. I mean, what he had, the glory that he had, the anointing that he had is gone. Now he's just at that place that he's blind. And, and Rockin, you can, you can make the connection spiritually that you have no vision and no focus. Your life just seems to be the same old, same old thing going round and round and round. And, and that's where Samson was. But in Judges chapter 16, Samson prayed a prayer. He's at the last of his life. He finds himself in this situation. He's blind. He's going in circles. Nothing's going on. And Samson prayed this prayer. Let me give you just a line. That's a very short prayer, but let me just give you an excerpt out of that prayer because what he said was so powerful. Samson had something wake up on the inside of him. Samson came to a place that said, this is not the life that I want. This is not where I want to be. And he prayed this prayer. He said, oh, God, strengthen me one more time. What a prayer. God, do it again. God, anoint me one more time. God, stir me one more time. God, put a fire in me one more time. Because I know what it was like to know you, to experience you, and I'm not there. But God, one more time, I've got to have that in my life again. And you know the story because God is a prayer answering God. God answered his prayer and Samson pushed down the Colosseum, pushed down the, uh, the, the support beams and, and killed more Philistines in his death than he did in his life. But I love the prayer, and we look at that, that said, God, anoint me one more time. 
See, something on the inside of him cried out. Something on the inside of him said, I can't keep doing what I'm doing. And can I give you what I think is some good advice? And here it is, is that we need to learn to live life from the inside out and not from the outside in. And here's the difference. When we are living life from the outside in, what we're saying basically is everything that is out there is influencing how I do life. When I live life from the outside in, then all my circumstances, all my situations, everything that I'm going through is determining the choices that I make, the decisions that I make, the direction that I go. But when I live life from the inside out, I'm making the decisions and I'm making the choices. I'm not living a life that is circumstance-based. I'm living a life that is based on what God is doing on the inside of me. One preacher said it this way, don't live your life according to the weather man. Live your life according to the spirit man. So if you live your life according to the prediction, it's always going to be stormy and rainy and something going on. But from the inside, they're going to say, if you're living from the outside in, they're going to say, today's going to be a bad day because it's going to storm. But from the inside out, you're saying, this is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let the storms come, man. I'm living life from the inside out. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God. Then all of these other things, everything else is going to fall into place. If I put God first, if I seek God first, then all of these other things are going to work out in my life. But if I reverse the order, what happens is I just end up trying to squeeze God in the little pockets in my life when I think about him. I just try to fit God in when I can and where I can. Instead of living a life that is God-filled and God-led and spirit-led. My friend Wayne Myers, Wayne, I think is 96 years old, still speaking, the, preaching the gospel, still, still ministering to churches in, in Mexico. And he made this statement. He says, live life in the light of eternity. Let what is about to happen shape your life and shape where you're going. Colossians chapter three, let me read a couple of verses to you. Paul is writing to the church there. And he says in chapter 3, verse 1, if then you were raised with Christ, I mean, no, we have been. We're raised with Christ. I mean, in the spirit. The Bible says we're seated at the right hand of the Father. We have spiritual authority in our lives. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. He's telling us where our mind needs to be. He's telling us where our head needs to be. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. Don't just live for what you see. Live for the things that are spiritual. Live life in the light of eternity with a spiritual focus on your life. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first God's agenda. Be engrossed, be caught up, or be all about heavenly things. Let let, let me just kind of explain what heavenly things are. It's real real simple. It's kind of one, two, three. Here's number one. Heaven is real. Aren't you glad this morning? Heaven's not some sort of spiritual Disneyland. Heaven is not some idea that, that we kind of get in our mind. It's not something that we just think could happen somewhere someday. Heaven is a real place where God lives. And then hell is real. And the thing about hell is is the same about heaven is that everybody ends up somewhere, but nobody ends up anywhere by accident. So whichever, whichever way you go is a choice that we make that says, I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus or I'm going to spend eternity, eternity without Christ in my life. We make that choice. Heaven is real, hell is real, and Jesus is coming back. Amen. 
You say, Pastor, I've heard all my life Jesus is coming back. You're absolutely right, and it's closer than it's ever been. Well, I don't know if I believe that. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters to you, but it doesn't matter to Jesus. Remember when Jesus died and, and he told everybody, I'm going to be back in three days, and nobody showed up? Nobody anticipated, nobody expected, but three days later, there he was. So we just need to understand that Jesus has a track record of doing what he says he's going to do. And so nothing is more important than your walk with God. Right? All right, let's, let's think of it a different way. How many of you here um, walk for exercise? I mean, just, you just, you know, you got a habit of kind of walking. There's a few of you got your hands up. That's great exercise. In fact, doctors tell us that's one of the best forms of exercise. 30 minutes walking a day is great exercise physically. It's good for your heart. It's good for your diet. I mean, it's good for your mind. It clears your mind. It does so many things. There are so many benefits of just walking on a regular basis. And yet the Bible tells us in the New Testament what I've been able to find, that there are at least nine things that the Bible says that we need to either walk in or walk out of. I'm not going to give you all nine this morning, but let me give you five of them. There are five things that the Bible says that we need to walk in in our life. If you're taking notes, here they are. Number one, we need to walk in the Spirit. That's Galatians 5, 16, walk in the Spirit. And that's exactly what we're talking about this morning is that we need to be more spirit-minded and spirit-focused than we are other-minded. We need to be aware of we need to be aware of spiritual things. We need to be aware of the spiritual world that is around us. We need to be aware of, of what God is doing and what God is saying and that God is speaking. We need to realize that, hey, God wants to speak to me today. God wants to use me today. God wants to do something in me and through me today. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Build a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Be filled up with the Holy Spirit. That's something God says, I want you to walk in the Spirit. Number two, we're told that we need to walk by faith. And walking by faith is what I call being a fourth dimension type of person. That it's not just what we see or hear or feel, but there's another dimension of that, that we can't even touch in that sense, but it is just as real. And that's when we walk by faith. That means I don't understand everything. I don't know every step. I don't know. I may not even know what's next, but I just know that I'm trusting God all along the way. And that I choose to believe God's word above anything else. God, I'm going to trust you faith walkers and faith talkers. We were sitting in a staff meeting the other day and we were just talking about things in the church. We're problem solving and we always try to fix things that aren't working and make sure everything's are working smooth and running smooth. And, and one of the things that we came up with is, is this, is that when we deal with anything in the church, we need to say what God says first. I mean, think that's good advice, right? If you're dealing with anything in life, listen, say what God says first. Before you talk about the problem, before you talk about the solution, before you talk about maybe how bad it is, talk about what God says first. The Bible says, let the weak say I'm strong. And so we just need to say what God says and speak that out into our life first and foremost before we do anything else. Get back to that place where God is our first response and not our last resort. Number three, we're to walk in the truth that we have. Let me tell you why that's powerful. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. But if I'll just walk in the truth that I have, then I'm confident that God's going to continue to lead me. I may not know everything. I may not know what I need to do every step of the way. But if I just walk in what I do know and keep doing what I do know, the pressure's off. I'm just following God doing what I know to do. Just do what it is that God has told you to do. And if you say, well, I've not heard what God is saying to me, then just keep doing the last thing he told you to do until he tells you something new to do. 
You're not going to miss God. Just keep, go back to the place that you last heard God and he directed your life and just keep doing that. Direction will come. Number four, we're told to walk in love. Easier said than done. I know, I get that. But we're called to walk in love, not, in, not, not to just tolerate the people around us. In fact, the Bible makes this incredibly radical statement that says, love your enemies. So we're to walk this love walk. And number five, he says we're to walk in newness of life. What does that mean? When you get born again, the Bible says that you become a new creation in Christ. What you used to be is passed away. Now you become something new. And so now God is saying, I want you to walk in newness of life. Now understand this, the Bible never asks for perfection. But God does ask for a new direction. He doesn't expect you to be perfect. He's not asking for perfection, but he does expect a new direction in your life. When you get born again and all things are made new, God wants you to begin to head and direct your life in a new direction. So when I walk in the newness of life, that means I quit living the way I used to live and I start living the way that I'm called to live. And it all involves around this is that every morning when I get up, I got to put off the old man and put on the new man. And that's something that I choose to do. Just like when you got up this morning and you decided you were coming to church, you had to stand there in the closet and you have to decide, okay, what am I going to put on? What am I going to wear? It's like some people are still standing there this morning. They didn't quite make it out of the closet phase of Sunday morning. But you got to make that choice that says, what am I going to put on? Because it doesn't just fall off the hanger on you. You've got to choose something and say, now that I've chosen this, I'm going to put it on and I'm going to wear this. And that's what the Bible says you do with the new man, the new way of living. I'm not going to live the way that I used to, but I make a choice. I'm going to put off the old man. That's, that says I'm saying no to what I used to be, how I used to act. And I'm going to put on the new man. That means I've got a new vision and a new direction for my life. I'm heading in a direction that God wants me to go. How many of you here have, have seen the series? I think it ended last year. How many of you here have seen the series, The Walking Dead? Anybody? A few of you, right? Basically what The Walking Dead is, is that it is a zombie apocalypse. Now, what a zombie is, is it is a person that is alive, kind of. It's a sort of a live person. It's the walking dead. They, they have life, but they don't have real life. And that's not what God has called us to be. That's what we were before Christ, is that we were alive, kind of. We were alive, sort of. But when Jesus came, Jesus said he came to give us, give us an abundant life or to make us fully alive. And so, therefore, we need to focus our hearts on living that life in the fullness of Christ. We need to live our lives being fully alive, not going through the motions, not just showing up, but becoming fully engaged in our lives. And just saying, God, I want a passion for you. God, I want to know you. God, I want to serve you. I want to experience you in my life. And it takes a purpose. It takes doing life on purpose, being focused to say, God, today I choose to be on fire. God, today I choose to be passion filled. God, today I choose to be passionate about my marriage. God, today I choose to be passionate about my walk with you. What about tomorrow? I don't know about tomorrow, but I'm just talking about today. Let's just say, God, today, I choose to stay passion-filled for you. And you'll never do that unless we make that decision to keep God first in our life. Father, this morning, our heart is to know you. 
God, our heart is, is to live that life, Father, not at the level that we're at, but at the level that we can be. Father, if we just, if we just make that effort to say, I want to live more passionately for God. I want to be more passionate about my life and my walk. And God, I want to keep you first place in my life. God, I pray that just the next few moments as we worship together, as we just get in your presence, God, that you stir that fire. As we put on the fuel, as we throw fuel on the fire, Father, of our worship, that you stir something on the inside of us in Jesus' name. I want to invite you to stand with us for just a moment. And it all begins with a choice. And I want to invite you this morning that if you, if you look at your life, wherever you are, and you say, I'm going to compare my life to a fire. And when it comes to what's going on on the inside of you, maybe you say, you know what, it's really non-existent. There's not much happening. That can change this morning. How many of you know it only takes a spark? It only takes a little bit. Oh, this morning, if something is smoldering and you think back, you know, there was a time that I was more on fire. I was more passionate. I was more intense about the things of God. That stirring, that desire begins to create that fire on the inside of you. So I want to ask you this morning, we're going to worship God with a chorus here. But we're going to do it very deliberately, very much on purpose. But before we do, I just want to speak to those for just a moment. that you say this morning I need God to start something on the inside of me see that's what I'm looking for this morning I think that's what God wants to do on top of what he's already done so for those this morning and, and it's not saying hey we know where you are or when you step out you know you're because only you know what's on the inside of you whether you're saying, God, I want more fuel. Or you're saying, God, I'm stirring what I had because I want to be like Samson and I want to say, God, anoint me one more time. Or maybe this morning you're just saying, I'm ready to start a fire.